Hi, Dr. James Amos once again uh, at uh, the Omni Hotel in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, give me a few of the highlights about uh, the American Delirium Society's second annual meeting, uh, 2012. And uh, this is the last day of the conference. It's June 5th. And I have a few remarks to say about uh, the morning sessions, which are very interesting, and uh, which included uh, many perspectives on delirium care in the 21st century. Uh, one of the delirium speakers included uh, outgoing president uh, Jim Rudolph, who's at Harvard University, and he talked about the delirium toolbox. And uh, the delirium toolbox consists of uh, some very basic uh, uh, elements, including uh, I, uh, identifying delirium risk, um, and it's more than just knowing about uh, Sharon Inouye's risk factors, uh, which are well known. Uh, the second step would be modifying delirium risk, uh, and this would be uh, placing nurses in the point position, although nurses and doctors need to work together. We're a team, and uh, there are, are more members of the team in uh, managing and preventing delirium than just nurses and doctors, and they include physical therapists, occupational therapists, and pharmacists as well, as well as many others. Uh, the third step would be monitoring for delirium, and that includes delirium assessment using um, any validated uh, assessment tool, including the confusion assessment method, uh, the CAM, or uh, the delirium observation screening scale, or others. Um, and the fourth step would be uh, standardizing delirium treatment. Uh, these are protocols that give everybody in the uh, delirium management team a specific task or role to play in managing and preventing delirium. And of course, the whole goal is to provide highest quality medical care for patients. And these would include your, uh, your grandmother, your grandfather, uh, or, or anybody you love. Uh, the idea is to prevent the scourge, delirium, from taking the lives of those we love the most, because that's what delirium does. It uh, increases the length of stay in the hospital, it increases mortality, meaning it kills people, uh, and it uh, sends people to long-term care facilities before they're ready to go. Uh, so that was Jim Rudolph's uh, presentation. I think the next presentation that really hit my funny bone was the one by uh, Dr. Joe Flaherty and uh, psychologist uh, uh, Sharon Gordon, who put together a little play about how to manage somebody who is elderly and delirious in the hospital. Uh, they can be very demanding, very loud, they're often disoriented, and the idea here is really to avoid controlling the patient, and uh, the whole title of the presentation, the title of the protocol for dealing with uh, elderly delirious patients in the hospital is TADA. So, T-A-D-A, -A, and it means tolerate, anticipate, and don't agitate. And it means letting go of lot, a lot of the ideas that nurses and doctors have about controlling people's movements and behaviors in the hospital and trying to restrict ev every movement and every behavior to the rules of the hospital. You don't always have to do that. You don't always have to stick a Foley catheter in a patient. And you don't always have to tell them that they need to be at bed rest strictly. Uh, so they put together this wonderful uh, comedic uh, kind of performance and role playing. Dr. Flaherty was actually playing the role of the elderly patient, and all this guy needs is an agent. Uh, so it was wonderful. Uh, the, uh, the other um, uh, presentation that I thought was uh, that I thought was uh, very interesting was Dr. Uh, e. Wesley Ely's presentation on what happens to uh, people in the ICU who lose um, normal restorative REM sleep. And that happens a lot because what tends to happen in critical care units is uh, there's a lot of use of sedating agents which don't help people uh, get the restorative sleep that they need. And non-restorative sleep and unconsciousness actually contribute to delirium, and they also, according to Dr. Ely, increase the rate of mortality. It kills people. And the use of benzodiazepines and other sedating agents that make people unconscious but don't get them to sleep normally 
is being done in hospitals all across the country. And Dr. Eagley and other uh, intensivists and, uh, and other uh, people who um, are experts in uh, preventing delirium are sounding the alarm about this practice and letting people know that uh, we need to change this particular practice. We need to wake people up and we need to not make them unconscious, which actually um, makes delirium worse, it causes delirium, and it leads to early death. So uh, I think that uh, this is uh, this was just this is these are just highlights of uh, what you can find at uh, conferences like the one put on by the American Delirium Society. And this is only the second annual conference, and, and it can only get better. So you want to consider becoming a member, and become a member early, and get involved uh, in working groups, uh, as Dr. Sharon in no way. Uh, points out. I mean, it's not enough just to come to a conference and make a great presentation. Uh, it's really more important to get involved, become part of a working group toward changing the way delirium is viewed, the way it's interpreted in hospitals, and the way it's managed. And uh, to become aware of the probability that if everyone works together as a team, and uh, the team includes many members, and they include the families of patients, uh, as well as physical therapists, occupational therapists, and uh, as well as doctors, we can prevent delirium and we can improve the lives of our patients and improve uh, on the way that uh, we uh, uh, improve the health of our patients and, uh, and our hospital care. Providing high quality medical care is really what uh, managing and preventing delirium is all about. Well, thanks for very much, and you can read more about uh, the American Delirium Society Conference on my blog site at jajsamos.wordpress.com, uh, or otherwise known as the Practical Psychosomaticist. Thanks very much for listening.